Hey everybody, it's Dan and it's that time once more to go around the world one more time and have a beer or two along the way. Thank you so much for coming out and joining us this week. I got to say thank you, first of all, to Rod and, uh, and also Don uh, for coming on the show last week. It's pretty amazing what this man who has absolutely no vision whatsoever can do making beer. And it's really cool that his partner is there to help him along the way to make sure, one, he doesn't burn the place down, two, he doesn't blow himself up, burn himself and three they're there to ensure and <laughs> to ensure they both enjoy the experience of making homebrew together so this is really really cool fantastic people if anyone has any information on adaptive equipment for visually impaired be it a uh, a talking hydrometer a talking thermometer anything like that that could help someone who is visually impaired to make beer Please let me know at my adventures in homebrewing at gmail.com so I can forward these on to these fantastic people because not only am I friends with Rod, who makes beer, but also the blind brew guy, Fred Coleman. He's also visually impaired, and this would also help him out. So, guys, let's band together here a little bit in our great little homebrew community and help our friends out. So, this week, we're really fortunate because we're going to go back home to where I grew up, down around St. John, New Brunswick, and talk to some really cool guys. We're going to talk to Christian and Derek from the community brew shop, and we'll see what they're up to. But until then, uh, give me a couple of minutes, and we're going to talk to the guys from Escarpment Laboratories. Hey, and we're back. And as you can see on the screen, they've been here like the whole time. We've got Christian down low and we got Derek up top. Uh, it may be a little different on their screen, so bear with me, guys. Uh, and these are the, the fantastic guys that had me on their show talking about uh, my adventure in, in home brewing and how I got started and things like that. Uh, now it's my turn to return the favor because I like to give these guys a little bit more traction because these guys are absolutely phenomenal, especially while well, they're maritimers and we're all cool people. So boys thank you so much for coming on my show thanks for having us yeah no thanks worries. For having us. hey no problem anytime a, anytime a maritimer can have another maritimer out why not you know we got to stick together yeah for sure <laughs> so you guys have started your shop and you know in our little talk beforehand derek was saying you guys always started this about a year ago now so based on that how about we'll start with Derek, because he was in first, Christian. I'm sorry. No we'll problem. start. We'll start with Derek, and we'll get a, get a little bit about yourself and your experience with home brewing, and then we'll roll down into Christian, and then I'll let you to two of you riff off each other to tell us how about how you got started and what actually inspired you guys to do this. Okay, cool. Yeah, so uh, I've been home brewing now, kind of on and off for a while, uh, probably since about 2001. I guess I started, you know, when I was going to university, much like several other home brewers and uh you know you struggle along try to save some money and you make those crappy uh you know kits that you can't seem to work with very well so i did that for a while uh then I actually started making wine because i found the beer was just not worth doing so i switched over to wine for a while with my you know my carboy and my bucket that kind of thing and uh you know after i kind of did that for a while i just put it all away and and I took a bit of a break. And then when I, when I got back into it really was, um, I would say probably about six, maybe seven years ago when I started uh, to realize that, you know, the equipment was better. I did a little more research. I've, I'd always been a, you know, a long time beer fan, whether it's, you know, my, in my travels, I always seek out unique places, that kind of thing. Or even on my local shelf, I always try to buy something, you know, imported or whatever to try. Whereas most of my friends were stuck in the you know, the, I guess the macro logger kind of loop. So, so I was always experimental. So when I start to started to research beer and get to know about it a little bit more, I really got more into the home brewing side of things and, and decided finally that, you know, I'm going to invest a little bit of money. I borrowed some uh, equipment from a friend to start with to do some all grain batches. And then I just kind of converted over into that. Uh, um, and that's where I am now, I guess. So Christian and I brew a lot together on a, a, a larger uh, system we usually do 10 gallon batches nice. uh, we can do up to 15 if we need to um and we also uh just got a bruzilla just to try it out and uh, see how that goes we've had a lot of uh, success with that as well so so that's kind of where we are now uh with our home brewing i guess uh to boil it down i guess the styles we brew are very historical or the ones that i prefer to brew christian's a little mm -hmm. bit more experimental but i i like to do the historical you know i like to research the beer go back and look to see, you know, 
how it was brewed a hundred years ago and try to replicate those kind of things. So okay. I guess that's, that's me and my brewing in a nutshell, I guess. If you're a historical beer guy, I'll send you a recipe. You'll, you'll, you'll knock your socks off. Okay. Perfect. All right. <laughs> All right, my friend, you're up. Yeah. So, uh, so my name is Christian. I'm uh, Derek's partner in crime on our little uh, home brewing adventure. So uh, I am much newer to the hobby than Derek is. I actually only got started in it a few years ago, um, maybe just about a, a year or so, maybe a little bit more a year before Derek and I started the shop. So um, Derek and I are, uh, you know, just haven't been friends for that long in the, in the grand scheme of things when we're, you know, you say we're both approaching kind of 40 years old. Um, we met at the gym and uh, Derek used to have a little uh, kind of beer tour business around some of the local breweries and stuff like that. And he needed someone to help him out. And uh, I've always been interested in beer. Um, I'm a big, was a big rugby player here in the city and the, the club here has a long tradition with Labatt's Brewery. So I've gone on the, you know, the beer tours and I've been down to the Keith room and all that stuff. And I've always kind of had this, kind of uh, adjacent interest in beer, but never on the home brewing side, really. And then when I started to do, uh, maybe four or five years ago, started to do these beer tours with Derek and learn more about craft beer and the scene around that. And then it just kind of spiraled from there. We started brewing just kind of off and on, just kind of having some fun on a, with a stovetop kit. And then um, we were buying from a local, uh, a local gentleman here out in KV, uh, in the valley, just outside of the city. And uh, unfortunately, due to health reasons, he had to... Uh, close his shop down and right around the time that he closed um we were starting to get into brewing together pretty seriously so we had bought this as Derek mentioned this big 23 gallon uh, kettle or 23 yeah 20 gallon kettle so we could do bigger batches and we had Derek bought a couple pumps and we started you know putting ball locks and quick connects and kind of really outfitting our gear to make more of a certainly not a professional setup but a really a setup that we could be proud of and uh so while Derek, as he mentioned, likes to brew traditional, mostly European styles, because that's that's where his family's from, um, I'm much more experimental because this is just so kind of new and fun for me at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I've, uh, you know, I've made like peanut butter porter. I've done Ooh, a yeah. Cadbury cream egg stout. Um, really? Like, yeah, well, it didn't turn out that well, but it was a fun little experiment. Oh, and uh, right. and uh, right. so, and I like to play with, you know, some of the more common adjuncts for modern beer styles. So vanilla, coffee. Um, I like to do a lot of stuff with fruit when I can. And I really like, like I, Derek always cringes, I'm sure when I say this, but I liked IPAs before it was cool to like IPAs. So now that I'm home brewing, um, I'm always using, like we brought in galaxy hops at the shop and yeah. we brought in Citra and like a lot of those big, heavy kind of dank hops. Cause that's what I like to play around with. So mm -hmm. we're kind of a fun pair like that because when customers come to us and ask for recipe advice, while I will grant that Derek does most of our recipes, he's been doing it a lot longer than me. Um, but I've got a little bit more, um, recent experience with those new modern styles, if you will. And, yep. and then Derek's much better with the traditional English styles, European yep. styles, Belgian, stuff like that. So um, yeah, we got started, like I said, just a little while ago, I borrowed a handful of books and did as much research as I can. And now we're, uh, now we're in business together. So it works out really well. So you know enough to be dangerous. I, exactly. I know enough to be dangerous. And I, I come from a sales background. I've been in sales since like 2004, sales, sales management, bouncing back and nice. forth. Nice couple co uh, companies. So I, uh, so it's great that way, especially for the business, because Derek does a lot of our inventory management, a lot of ordering. He's really up on trends on what grains are popular, what mm -hmm. hops are popular. He's great at sourcing things because he's been doing this for so long. And I manage the website and the social media channels and, you know, liaison with customers on the phone and stuff like that. So, yeah. Awesome. So is the shop uh, like, do you have a storefront or is it all online? Right now, it is only online. Um, okay. As Derek mentioned, we um, we started this during the pandemic. Um, yeah. The uh, our local shop closed down about a year before we went into all this lockdown stuff, and there was kind of some stories floating around that someone might be you know purchasing the interest in it and you know keeping it going sort of thing. And we we let it sit for you know eight, nine, ten months, and just nothing ever came of it. So we were like, well, you know, we're we're spending a lot of money where we want to do this more seriously. So we, mm -hmm. we made some contacts with BSG and some other suppliers and we just kind of started rolling with it. But because of the pandemic, we were like, you know, I've got a little bit of web develop ex uh, development experience, just mostly as a hobby, but you yeah. know, I could get it kind of get us going that way. 
So we, um, we rent a, uh, you know, a secure kind of very clean sanitary storage locker where we keep all our grain and kind of our adjunct products, like our biofine and, you know, our different yeah, chemicals yeah, yeah. and things like that. And then <clears throat> we, we grabbed a couple of refrigerators and all the, uh, all the cold stuff. I have, a, I have a basement here in my house that I don't use. So all of our cold stuff just stays here with me so that it's all sealed properly and we can offer the highest quality to our customers um, without the storefront. So we're, we're making it work, I think. So are you finding that a lot of people, at least in the, in the, in the community down where, uh, down home are embracing you guys? Are you finding that there's people asking really good questions about stuff or are they just coming in and saying, just hook me up and pray to God it works. I'll let Derek state this one. Cause he does a lot of our recipes and we get a lot of requests to build recipes. So. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I would say we had we've had tremendous support from the community and uh, there's been a lot of new interest as well, especially during the pandemic with people being at home and that kind of thing. People saying, you know, can you make me this home beer of something that I, I tried? It's a craft beer. So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll actually uh, we'll try to develop clones. I mean, we don't go right to the breweries and ask for the recipe unless we can find it somewhere. But, uh, you know, we try our best to to make a beer that's, you know, if we know the hops they're using, the typical mm-hmm. grain bill for that, that's where kind of the historical background that I have is is good. And Christian has a good knowledge of the, you know, newer style hops. So a lot of times we can kind of develop a similar recipe. I mean, you're never going to get it the same as a, as a microbrewery, but, uh, but it's, it's similar. So we have had a lot of support um, from the community, like uh, even that and our friends, you know, coming over and, and loving our beer that we make and share that kind of thing. We also do a, uh, a loaner program, kind of like when you used to rent the old video game systems at the, you know, at the corner store, you can, yep. you can borrow our gear uh, oh. for a $20 deposit and uh, we'll set you up. we got a whole instruction manual, how to use it and that kind of thing. And that's been actually pretty successful as well. So with that usually comes a, uh, a customized recipe. So we usually ask people what they want to brew um, and we'll try to develop a recipe, something that they would like. And we can, we're there as, uh, you know, as they brew for technical support, anything like that, we just, mm-hmm. they call us on the phone and we can walk them through a step if they're stuck or whatever it is. So, so it's been, uh, it's been good support. We've actually seen a lot of people migrate um, with that low loaner program into, to be in, you know, more regular customers, that kind of thing. So it, it they've, they've been very supportive uh, of our business since we started for sure. Well, right on. So <clears throat> being the maritimer I am, I've got to ask this, how many people have asked for recipes that resemble Alpine and schooner. You know, there's going to be people out there asking for those two beers. I'm an old schooner drinker. So I'm, oh, I'm no! I, I know, right? I know. No! I, haven't told, I, I haven't told Derek this yet. I'm working on a secret schooner clone recipe in my darkest moments. Let me tell you. But, um, no, I, uh, we haven't actually, to be honest with you, the, the people that have been interested, especially the, the people that have been interested in the loner gear definitely have that craft beer buzz about them, that craft Good. beer edge that so we do get a lot of requests for traditional styles. Um, Derek's got a great, uh, red recipe, uh, for okay. a traditional English style that we, that customer's actually been a repeat. He's loaned, he's got the loaner gear a couple times. We don't even charge him a deposit anymore because we've seen him a couple of times. So <laughs> we, uh, so we, so we have had requests for some, uh, traditional styles, but far and away, far and away, we get requested for IPAs the most. So okay. we do, we do um, some all grain kits that Derek developed the recipe and I worked on some packaging and stuff like that. And we, so we do have um, kind of our own customized kits that all feature a local gradient uh, to kind of let them stand out from some of the more, you know, established commercial kits. And because of the, the, the amount of requests that we've gotten for IPAs, uh, Derek's working on five new kits uh, to add to our lineup that are all kind of variations, West Coast, East Coast, traditional English, mm-hmm. um, you know, a citrus kind of style, because that's, we know right now, whether it's trendy or whether it stays, it's, uh, that's what people want to brew. So we're here to try and support them. Yeah. I, and that's one thing that I, I, I have seen is a lot of people who uh, gravitating towards the the hop head side, going towards a lot of hoppy beers, going towards the IPAs and things like that. And while I I get it, but there's only so much of an IPA someone can take. Um, I mean, I'm like Derek. I, I, I like doing the traditional beers. I like doing historical stuff, but I'm also I like screwing around with stuff uh, as well. Um, I mean, I've made a s'mores stout. Uh, just, I think tomorrow it's actually brew day. I'm going to be doing a full on Baltic border and then, oh, nice. then I'm that's going to my, be, uh, that's actually next on my agenda. I'm going to do one this week as well. Oh yeah. I'll send you my recipe yeah. and see what you think. 
Okay. Yeah. I'd like and to then, <laughs> then I'm going to be do, doing a Russian Imperial and throwing it inside of a five gallon bourbon barrel once it's all fermented out. So, oh, wow. so I, I understand what you're saying, but what are some of the craziest questions you get from customers? Are they, are they asking you, so this will be ready in a week? Will this be ready in five days? How do, how do I, how do I get the bubbles in it? Uh, Cause those are some of the questions I actually have gotten on, on brew days when I've actually, when I've done had people over and they're like, all right, so it's done. So it's alcohol now. Right. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you still have to <laughs> ferment it. Well, how do you ferment it? Uh, I go, do you see those vessels over there? Yeah. It's <laughs> going to go in there. You are going to add yeast and we're going to go from there. I mean, there are a lot of, I hate, I'm not going to say stupid questions, but there are a lot of questions that you got to scratch your head at. So what are some of the crazy questions you guys have had? Um, I don't know. Derek wrote our, uh, our step-by-step manual for the loaner program. And it's, I mean, the, you got to see this thing. It's, you know, hardcover, there's tabs, there's pictures, there's wow. warning. There's, it's very, very extensive. So um, I don't think I've had any like real wild questions. I mean, we've gotten, we've been very fortunate that the people that have come to us for, uh, you know, for, for business and for advice or whatever, at least have done a little bit of research themselves, which makes mm-hmm. it great for us as business owners, because it shows that they've got a little bit of skin in the game. So we often get questions around uh, more. So some of the advanced products we carry, like, uh, like the, we have the escarpment labs, uh, lactic magic yeast, which is kind of, yeah, it's a great product. Derek, Derek brought it in, oh. did all the research on it. And, um, but there is a, there's almost like a, like a secondary component to brewing with that. Right. Yeah. So we've had questions around that and uh, you know, some questions around fruit, but I think, I mean, Derek can speak to the recipes, but we, we, most of our questions are around, I like this beer or my wife likes this beer. Like how do, how do I replicate that? So right. you know, I'll let Derek speak to that. Yeah. So like if we're, if we're starting with a new customer and the, the great thing is like, if, if you call the store number, you get Christian. So we're right there to, to kind of go back and forth. But if it's a new customer, a lot of times, uh, we'll try to steer them towards a more simple recipe, even if they're trying to go extensive. Like I'm, I'm sure you've experienced it too. Like you brew your first pale ale and then all of a sudden you're like, okay, I want to brew this like chocolate tiramisu milkshake mm-hmm. stout or something like that. Mm-hmm. So we try to steer people away from that for their first brew. So we try to keep it fairly simple with their first one. So if the questions come up, it'll be brewing related more so than, you know, what do I do at, at this point? Cause I'm really confused. So like our, uh, our manual that comes with the loaner program, uh, it, it's for a very, I would say not a basic beer because a basic beer can be awesome, but it, it's mainly geared towards uh, those simple like uh, recipes. So as far as the, um, the questions we get, um, they're usually about like a step in the process, but yeah, we've had questions as well. Like, you know, okay, you have people text you. I, I work a night shift, so you'll have a guy text you at like, you know, 2.30 in the morning and he's like, uh, when can I drink my beer? I just finished brewing. <laughs> I'm like, oh man, that's a long brew day. <laughs> wow. And I'm like, well, you got to give it a couple of weeks now. Just let it kind of ferment and do its thing. So the fermentation I find is, is actually one of the, the biggest things that people don't really have a, a good grasp on. Um, like you can follow the process that is written out in the manual we have or any step-by-step process on your equipment, but it's, uh, it's really the fermentation that people, they get a little bit uh, squirrely because you, you have to wait for it. So it's a, uh, you know, they get a little sensitive when it, when it comes to that kind of stuff. So I would say most of the questions we get are probably in the fermentation stage, not so much, you know, the mash in or, or temperatures of water, that kind of thing, because anyone can pretty much figure that out. It's just that, that final stage I find is where a lot of the questions kind of originate from. Yeah. I find that uh, people kind of like the same thing. They have a tendency to go from, yeah, I've made this great uh, smash beer. So people who, who are, just tuning in, you don't know what a smash beer is. Smash is single malt, single hop. Uh, and that is the best way to start. And then they're like, okay, we've done this. Let's go on to the most advanced thing we can possibly think of. How hard can it be? And in my opinion, the hardest thing out there to do is, is a decoction mash brew day. I will yeah. not touch that with a 10-foot barge pole. Just because I know it's beyond my capabilities and I really don't have any desire to even try and go there because the idea of having to take out part of the mash, put it inside of another pot, do it, let it do its thing, get the other one going, then add the, add it in at another point. I mean, that's, to, to be honest, that's one too many steps. <laughs> it's just one yeah. too many steps. It's not because I'm lazy. It's just because I'm old and I don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the other thing is too, I guess when you look at the most of the ingredients nowadays, I mean, they're so 
well modified like some of those processes are kind of obsolete unless you're trying to make you know a super historical beer like i've done a couple experiments like that as well like with uh baking the mash and then yeah. and then uh, remashing it in like you would in like the traditional you know like lithuanian styles that kind of thing and mm-hmm. and really at the end of the day the the beer tastes great but it it's like you know was this worth it it, t- it took me you know nine hours instead of five and a half to make this beer and now my kitchen's a mess and all that other yeah. stuff so so I get it, but yeah, people kind of jump the gun. I, I find a lot of new brewers, especially they, you know, they, like you said, they get one good one under their belt and they're trying to get into something else. Exactly. And I don't think people really understand. You're going to have some great days and then you're going to have some really, I can't believe I'm dumping a bucket worth of beer down the drain just because yeah. either it's gotten infected, it's oxidized or just something went wrong. Mm-hmm. and when it comes time when it's, you think it's done fermenting out you get a whiff of it and it doesn't smell right there's yeah. always that chance that something's going to go wrong and and unfortunately i find people also assume that well it, it couldn't have been me it, it's not the equipment it's not the materials it's the person putting everything together that if you miss i hate to, i guess not hate to say it, but i got need people to understand when you're making beer stick to your recipe don't deviate yeah. when it says there it's laid out in steps, follow your steps. Yeah. And, and, and I find that some people are like, well, I don't need that. Or I get questions. Why do I need to follow the steps? Well, the steps are there for a reason. It's like, if you're baking a cake, you're not going to say, oh, I don't need to add in eggs or I don't need to add milk. You need those things. Are you finding yeah. that people are saying, well, why do I need this? Why should I do this? Or, or even for things like sanitation, do you think, why do I need that? I'll just blast it with, with bleach or something. Yeah, I guess, I guess we do get some questions like that. More of the, um, probably more of the, because of the book that we have, especially in the loaner program or that we've emailed the people with questions because it's so detailed, we get more of a question of, um, like the sanitation one's pretty simple. Everyone knows you got to have clean gear and it's, it's outlined very, very, we make a huge point of stressing that to customers and we outline it as much as we can. So I think most of the questions we get are, what does this step do for my beer? Yeah. So like, why, why do I spark? Why can't I just fill the bucket with water, fill the cooler with water? We have a, like a modified Coleman cooler, cooler right. for a mash on <clears> the <throat> out. So it's like, you know, so then you, know, you keep the water two inches above, you let it sit, it, you know, you have your mash time, your timer goes off after an hour. Well, why is it 60 minutes? Why isn't it 90 minutes? Why isn't it 30 minutes, right? Or yeah, yeah. then why, why do you sparge or the um, doing the Volrath, the recirculate, make, try to bring up some clarity and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Like that's, you know, it's, it's a foreign word. It's a, it's kind of a weird action where you're just pouring the same liquid back in on top of itself. So I, I don't, I wouldn't say we get questions of like, um, you know, why am I doing this? I'm getting questions of what is this doing for my brew? Why right. does this make it better than just boiling a pot of water on the stovetop sort of thing? Okay, so, yeah. right on. So what are people gravitating to now for, for the type of ingredients that they're taking? Are they taking like the traditionals like Turo, Pilsner, Miller Sauter, or are they going for some really crazy stuff? Uh, two row is definitely our most popular seller. Um, we have, a we, we get Canadian two row from Alex, Alberta, like a lot of supply shops do. Um, we have a very aggressive price on it for bulk. Now that we have kind of a, like a, a regular customer base, we do have a number of people that like to buy big, uh, base grains in bulk. So a lot of our base grains have bulk pricing and the two row is very, very aggressively priced, which we, you know, we want to try and, you know, support our customers as best we can. We also carry a new uh, uh, two row that's grown and malted right here in New Brunswick, just about nice. probably two hours from where we are now. We're still testing it a little bit for things like efficiency and sugar mm-hmm. content and things like that. The the gentleman that's malting it is also very new to the malting process. He's, he's a farmer, but um, so we carry a lot of that. Um, we're big fans of Mayor Sauter. So we, so we, we kind of put that into a lot of recipes and we push that a bit. Um, of course the crystals are always going to be good sellers and, uh, we used to sell a ton of dry yeast, uh, but then when we started carrying the escarpment labs, we started bringing in a lot more of that. It's a little bit more of a tricky, uh, game as business owners, because there's a, like a much shorter shelf life yeah. on the liquid stuff. But now that we've got probably made what, uh, probably six or seven orders from escarpment, we've got it dialed in that we know the ones that we can always turn over two, three, four, about five bags before the expir- before the expiration date. And then we always bring in one or two different ones, maybe a limited edition release yeah, or something yeah. like that, just to try it out. Um, but Derek, Derek does most of our inventory because he's much more familiar with some of the niche grains, things like golden promise, brown malt, right. different things like that. So he, uh, he's kind of, 
keep his eye on that. And I just keep pushing the stuff that that's kind of a daily seller sort of thing. Nice. So what are you finding, Derek, that people are taking to not just IPAs, but are they going towards like the darks the, or the browns or for their beers? Yeah, it, it, it's just like the craft beer market. Like it, it's very seasonal. So we see a lot of trends like this time of year, people are starting to, you know, turn over to some darker grains, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, as far as running the shop inventory goes, we're always going to have those, those base grains, which I think are going to be, you know, staples in everyone's household because they make up such a, a large amount of the grist. But we do find though, that we've, we've had pretty good luck with, uh, you know, some of these kind of grains that you can't find everywhere else, like red wheat and stuff like that, which is becoming pretty popular. And, uh, even with the hops too, when we bring in some of the obscure items, they've actually been selling pretty good around here. So I would say that probably the more, more experienced home brewers are starting to get a little more experimental. Uh, yeah. you know, they still brew the IPAs probably during the summer, just like everybody else does. But I think during the, the winter months, you know, like you and you and me, we're going to try a Baltic Porter, like something yeah. that, you know, you're not going to find on the shelf at the liquor store. You're not going to find your, your local microbrewery doing because it's, you know, it's, it's a big heavy beer and it's something yeah. you want to age a little bit and you can enjoy it for years to come. Uh, we can, that's what I like about the homebrew game because, you know, we can store this stuff for five years and not worry about sitting on it. Whereas, you know, if you're a craft beer producer or a, a macro producer, you're trying to get it on the shelf and, and get it to your customers. Get it right? gone. Yeah. Cause their yeah. beers, their, those beers are always better fresh when it comes out of a, of a, out of a large tank. I just find at, yeah. on the, on the smaller scale, as long as you're able to keep it somewhere dark and cold, you're golden. And unfortunately for, for the craft brewers is that, their walk-ins they have to share them not only with kegs but also their cans so they're limited on space and what they can have unless they have an off off off-site storage but then they're paying for it so then it's dipping into their profits so i totally understand what you're saying now what are you guys enjoying to be making lately i know you're saying that you have your own setup so i'm assuming that your setup other than the brazilla is a is a propane system I'm, yes, assu- I'm yeah. assuming that. So yeah. what, are you, what are you liking more, the propane or the electric? <laughs> well, well, the electric's very new. Um, yeah. And uh, it's uh, we keep our large system at Derek's. He has a garage and he has a, quite a nice backyard all fenced in, kind of keeps the wind down. So we do our, our large brews there for the most part. And the bruzilla kind of stays with me. I've got young kids and kind of a, a, a busy home life. So the, the convenience of the electric is really appealing to me. So being able to, you know, fill it the night before, set the timer. And then when I come home from work the next day, my water's hot. So I can even do like right. an evening brew if my kids don't have an activity. Cause you know, in all honesty, my weekends are kind of shot. So, I mean, if I'm going to, if Derek mm-hmm. and I are going to plan a big brew day, like that's something that, you know, it's especially going into hockey season now, that's like a two, three, four week endeavor for myself to plan it out. So, but I learned, um, I mean, we only did, I only did a few stovetop brews with Derek before we invested in the propane system. So, you know, most of my time is spent on the propane. So, I mean, I guess since I'm really loving this hobby now and I'm loving this business, um, I think the propane will always have a special place in my heart, but Derek's done a lot more different stuff than I have. So, (laughs) Yeah, I think it, it's an age old debate and you read about it in the, the brewing magazines, you know, propane versus electric and you see it every year kind of coming yeah. through. I guess the, the convenience of the electric is definitely something that's, uh, you know, it, it's something that I, I like for sure. And, and Christian obviously enjoys it, but, uh, you know, Christian and I are both outdoor enthusiasts. So I, I think that's probably why we're both a little bit more, you know, we can be outside in minus 15 in a snowstorm brewing beer outside and we're, we're just as happy. You know what I mean? We don't mind. I mean, it, it causes a lot of issues with our system because we're, you know, there's heat loss and all that yeah. kind of stuff, but, but we still like the, I, I mean, a brew day outside in the summer, like that's kind of one of our favorite things to do. We just sit and shoot the shit and kind of hang out and it, it is a little bit of a longer process. There's a lot of hauling stuff in and out, but uh, yeah. I think, you know, for, for me, I prefer, prefer the, uh, you know, the propane just because it's outside. Like, yeah. but uh I can definitely see see the luster of the uh, of the electric though. Like I mean, to to turn things on and flick a switch and away you go and program things like that would be definitely beneficial as well. So yeah, I mean, I, I've only been doing electric since I've gotten back into it. Just because in my garage, I don't trust myself to have an open flame because I will burn my house down. Because <laughs> that, that's that's me. Um, but I find the electric systems um, one 
are, they're easier to control because once you have it set, that's where it stays. And you can have um, your neoprene sleeve around the outside of it to help maintain temperature. So if you do drop your temperature where you need to, it'll be a gradual descent to where it needs to be. Not just, okay, I'm going to crank it down. Then all of a sudden your temperature just goes, drops like a rock. Like I'm mm -hmm. assuming kind of what it does with propane. Yeah. I, I'm, I could be wrong. Most of the time I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not wrong about that one. All Especially right. if it's a windy day and, and Derek was pretty close to the water. So we do see pretty significant temperature yeah. drops if we just yeah. cut the flame. So. Yeah, yeah. We have a, we have a Herms coil for uh, temperature control in our mash. So it's not, uh, Okay. Uh, Freestanding, free so we recirculate the water through a, a tank that's heated, so we, we don't scorch the bottom of our, uh, nice. of our mash tun, and it just kind of keeps it regulated. So it does control a little bit of the the drops and the rises. But like Christian said, you know, you get a windy day out there, you got your your flame on your Herms tank going at full blast, and you still can't seem to to get the temperature yeah. going up if it's super cold out. So yeah. uh, I can contest that. I mean, my wife doesn't let me brew in the house. <laughs> I wonder why. Um, <laughs> I saw my garage is pretty much my brewery and I'm out there in the winter. I'm brewing away. I'll be out there. I'll sit in the garage and may have a little space heater going and, or even during the summer, the summers here are a little brutal because they do get up closer to like, like 32 or 37 degrees Celsius. So it yeah. can get a little, it can get a little, sorry about that. My son was trying to chime in. <laughs> there you go so uh yeah it, it it is um it can be a little challenging especially when the heat's there um what i find is if with electric is is that i have to be con conscious of what i have plugged in where and when i turn it on otherwise i'm popping circuits on the panel okay which is a downside to electric uh, on the and that's where it's a bonus for propane. You don't have to worry about if your power goes out, you can still make your beer. Yeah. So, which is, which is a bonus. So, I mean, there's, there's a plus side to each thing. I mean, one's yeah. a lot, a lot easier to, to transport, but you need a supply for power. Another one, it's a little heavier, but you're guaranteed it's going to work all the time. Yeah. 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 And we like the portability too of the, the propane as well. Like Christian and I have talked about, we haven't actually done it yet, but going, you know, camping to Mount Carlton, the, the provincial park or going to Cushabaquack or something and making a beer there and, you know, just kind of bringing the ingredients with us and kind of letting the wild beast do its thing when we're done and see what we yep. get out of that. Cause we both like the foraging aspect and being outdoors too. So that, that's another benefit to the propane, I guess that you wouldn't get with the electric. You can do it wherever you want. So. Yeah. I was thinking about doing that too, going out to a, like a provincial park, whatever else, bring my, uh, like a, like a kettle, I could get from a friend or a keggle. And just and and a and a five gallon keg, and use the keg as the fermenter with a spunding valve, and just do everything that way, and that way it's okay. In the in the car it goes, tie it off, make sure it doesn't flop all over the place like a crazy fish, and then we're good yeah. to go. But what are some of the what are some of the things for new homebrewers? Do you think they should know? Um. I think what we try to instill on people is that, you know, quality is where you want to start no matter what. So we take a lot of pride in the ingredients and things like that, that we bring in to sell to new brewers and experienced brewers. And we take a lot of pride in our loaner gear. So we make sure that it's all kept up to snuff and it's clean and everything. So we try to instill in, especially new customers to say like, you know, you really have to plan for your brew day. This isn't something you do while you're trying to play frisbee with your kid in the yard or while you're, yeah. you know, changing the oil in your car or something like that. Right. So like if you're interested in this hobby because you like beer and you like the, the process of making beer and you want to learn more about it, like there's a wealth of knowledge to learn and every little tiny tidbit of information you pick up is going to make your brews that much better. So I guess the big thing for me was that I, I, and I've talked to some friends that aren't brewers that have kind of asked me questions since we've got into this and they're like, oh, so you just kind of, you know, boil some water and, you know, throw in some sugar. And then like a few days later you have beer and it's like, well, mm -hmm. no, it doesn't have to be complicated, but it's certainly more complicated than that. So I think the big thing that we try to express uh, on new home brewers is you really want to make sure that you plan out your day. It's mm -hmm. one of the things that we recommend when we give our loaner, our brew manual to people is like, you need to sit with this the, the night before, two nights before and look through it because you don't want to be on step seven and then realize that you don't have any, any idea what to do on step nine. So when yeah. we 
yeah. have had that, you know, people read through it and then they call us two or three days beforehand. They're like, well, what's this, what's the sparge or why am I doing this? Or, you know, what kind of thing? And we get those questions and, and that's great because we're not, we're not trying to onboard new customers as one shot. You make a beer, you give it to your buddies, y'all have a good couple laughs. Like this is a great hobby. Um, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm a testament that you can find friendship in it and, and build friendship and, you know, it's, it's, it, and, and learn a lot and, you know, in, in our case, have a business interest as well. So we don't, uh, we're not interested in one night stands and we try to make sure that our customers, you know, we instill that sense of quality and pride on our customers on, especially new customers. Right on. How about you, Derek? Yeah. So I guess uh, one thing that we talk about a lot too with new customers is uh, especially when they're looking for, you know, okay, I like this loaner program. Now I want to get into, you know, starting to brew again, or, you know, I, I used to homebrew in the kits. So I tell them my story, like I did to you at the start. Yeah. I used to brew on the stove top and it always tasted like garbage. So I got out of it. Yep. So what do I need to do? So what we try to instill as well is, you know, Start small, get the process down first. Once you understand the process, then start looking into, you know, where you want to go with this because it, it can get quite expensive. And that's, that's, I guess, one of the big warnings, like, you know, there's just as much equipment out, out there as there is, you know, different types of malt. So, you know, you got to narrow down what's going to fit into your lifestyle. And again, we talked about propane versus electric, that kind of thing, but uh, we don't sell a lot of equipment at the store. And, and the main reason is because there's so much out there, like, uh, you know, there's, there's the all in one systems, which we're just starting to experiment with, which we like, you know, you can buy any size pot you want and get right into it. But we try to convince people to start on a smaller scale and get used to the process before you start to go, you know, shopping for equipment. And because what's going to happen is you're going to end up spending all this money and then it's going to sit in your garage because you don't know what to do with it. So, so that's, I guess, one of our, our key things is to make sure people, you know, keep it realistic. And we try to suit even a loaner program is suited towards, you know, uh, like a one, a one person brewing system, or maybe have someone to help you out once in a while. But we even say in there, you know, uh, keep your kids out of the kitchen when you're brewing, cause there's hot liquids and they're going to be interested. Yeah. And we make sure that, you know, it, it, we want to make sure it's done safely as well. Like you have to realize there's that trade off, right? So we try to instill that in people and especially with, you know, new brewers, it's hard to, cause I mean, you can look up, look online, you can buy a spike, uh, turnkey system for, you know, like three thousand dollars, but you know, are you ready for that? Because you brewed one on your stove top, or do you even know what yeah. the process is to get into that style of thing, right? Yeah, that spike system is just like it's just out of reach right now. As much as I want that bad boy, is there's a lot of rewiring at my house I would have to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just not, just, yeah. just not quite ready to put two twenty into my house just yet. But yeah. I to I totally understand. Um, what you're saying about things like cost and, 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 and things like that. Cause I do have friends. Uh, they're like, Oh yeah, it's uh, what it cost you. Like what my four or $500. And I was like, yeah, four or $500 just for one piece of equipment. And, yeah, they're, like, yeah. and, they're, and they're like, what? So once you start with this, like this, I call it a passion. It, 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 you sort of go down the rabbit hole pretty damn fast. I mean, yeah. then, then I get the questions. What do you mean? I'm like, well, what I mean is, <laughs> Once you start with, we'll say, with a, a Brazilla and you have the bucket and a carboy, then you're like, oh, maybe I want some stainless steel or maybe I want a conical. Oh, maybe I want a glycol chiller. And then it just spirals from there. I mean, I, I will admit right now I am looking at maybe getting a, um, a, a K-Glan semi-pro canner or, yeah. or, an, or an SS Brutec, their new mill that they have that with the 25-pound hopper. Okay. Just it's just that for me that one that mill would come in a lot handier than me standing over a plastic bucket with a, a ver like a, like a, a variable drill, hoping that everything is set properly and going. With this thing, you can actually just set your gap, push the button, you're done. Done. Okay. Yeah. 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 I feel your pain though. Cause literally I, but we bought the Bruzoa like I think three weeks ago. And then just as pure coincidence, we brought on a new supplier for the shop that oh, nice. we could get, get Bruzella accessories from just a few mm -hmm. days after that. And it was the first thing I did. I was like, Oh, I can get a sight glass kit for this. And I can get mm -hmm. this kit for that. Like it's mm -hmm. like, okay, slow down. I just spent 500 bucks. I don't need to, don't need to keep yeah. pumping more money into it. But 
I also have a lot of respect for uh, some customers that we have that that know their process and they have stuck with it because it works for them. So we have a customer that's a, a, a fireman and he does brew to bag system. He's yep. placed a number of orders from us. He knows how he likes his crush. If he gets a, if he misses his gravity target, he'll call us up for his next order and say, you know, I want to try this this time because I was a little bit under and can you, so he's, he really you know, it's a very simplistic brewing system, but it very clearly works for him. And he knows the process inside and out by the conversations we've had with him. So to Derek's point, like, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can do this, but I think key is finding what way works for you. Right on. Yeah. And for, from that example too, like, I mean, uh, you know, you could, you can learn a lot from reading something online instead of buying a, you know, five or $600 pot to make your the brew day more efficient. Maybe that's not even the problem. And, and we find that a lot with new home brewers and, and we're victims of that too. Like there's certainly equipment I have laying around here that I'm never going to touch again, just because of just like, Oh, I need this. And then, you know, I bought the upgrade from that. And now I'm stuck mm -hmm. with this thing, which is a you know piece of equipment that I'm, we're not going to need for our system. So it's uh yeah, I think that's another good piece of advice, I guess, coming out of that is to, you know, with that process, learn it. And, you know, you could do it very simply or you could do it very complex but, uh, you know, the more you know or the more brews you do on that system, you can really dial things in and make excellent beer. And really, that's what all the, the microbreweries are focusing on now. Like, you know, we had this weird made kettle or whatever, and this is how we use it. And it turns beer out really good. So I think that's kind of, the, I guess, knowledge based. Uh, yeah, I, I guess learning instead of purchasing things from uh especially first time brewers or, you know, oh, people who aren't super experienced. So absolutely. I mean, I've got people saying, well, I've been to this brewery out by where you live and they have this system called a party guile, uh, which is you can do one kind of like, like boil or mash and boil. And then you've that from that, it can be converted into four or five different beers into different from, or, or is it different? It is a weird ass system. Leave it. Let's let it at that. Because there's only like a hand, maybe a handful of breweries in North America that use this system. It is that weird. And yeah, that's like, usually the, the monasteries do that. I think in Belgium, yeah, their beers, yeah, yeah. And it's like, well, what do you have that's like that? I said, I have absolutely nothing. I have yeah. one kettle, one mash tun, and then maybe two or three fermenters and a bright tank. That's it. And they're like, but what if you want to make five beers at once? Then you got five brew days coming at you. Yeah. yeah. Um, That's um, the best part. Five brew days. I'll take that any day of the week. <laughs> five brew days and a golf day in there. I mean, I'm, I'm, <laughs> it's all set. So what, what else would you guys like to say to everybody? What, what are some, like some nuggets of wisdom that you want to share? Oh, that's Derek's department. Oh, there we go. <laughs> oh, <man. Okay. laughs> Yeah, I think we we touched on a lot of those those highlights already. You know, yeah. Uh, keep it simple. Uh, one other thing you can do is hook onto someone that's in the hobby. Like I'm sure you have friends, Dan, that come over and yep. have a million questions, and and that's where we've actually a lot of our loaner stuff has gone out to our friends, and uh, they're trying to make you know I want to make a English style beer or something like that. So so hook onto someone who knows something about homebrewing, and uh, you know go for the ride. And I know uh, I think. You also work at a craft brewery as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's another good way. Like I find around here, especially, I don't know, it's the same way where you are, but in the Maritimes, you can pretty much walk right into the brew house in most places and start asking mm -hmm. questions to the brewer and they'll show you everything you want to know. So, uh, yeah, I would say get involved, uh, you know, join your local brew club. We just, uh, we're starting to get more involved with the Canadian, uh, home brewers association to try to you know, just to try to help them out and get, get nice, not so much more customers, but we like to share experiences and that kind of thing yep. too. Um, but uh, yeah, just get involved and, and ask questions and, and, you know, give us a call or give your local home brewer a call. There's lots of uh, resources out there and, and especially with the internet at our fingertips and yeah. you know, there's tons of good books out there on brewing, that kind of thing. Uh, not so much for home brewing or like starting out home brewing. There's not much, much on that but yeah hook on to someone i would say that would be my biggest piece of advice to try to get to get to know the brewing and and, and learn your uh learn your processes before you go and spend all your money absolutely um yeah just to touch on what you're saying about the the craft brewers yeah where i work uh i wouldn't have gotten back into it if it wasn't for my boss who just let me bend his ear as much as i could asking as many questions as i could to to get inspired again and which led me down the rabbit hole in investing almost my life savings <laughs> into, into what I have. But yeah. 
to anybody out there that's listening, uh, honestly, if you have a craft brewery that's close to you, if you go in and ask for maybe to see the back, uh, nine times out of 10, the brewer will come out, bring you to the back, and then you can just chew his ear off. And they're, I'll guarantee you, dollars to donuts, they'll tell you everything you need to know. There's there's nothing hiding in this in this community. So with that said, gentlemen, thank you so much for being on the show. It's always nice to talk to guys from down home. It's been a long time since I've been there. So hopefully when things calm down, uh, I'll be making my way back home probably maybe next summer and I'll, I'll pop in and maybe I'll bring some beers with me that I've made and we can sit back, kick back and shoot the shit a little bit. So yeah, we love that for sure. <laughs> All right, boys. Well, everybody, this was Derek and Christian from the Community Brewer Shop down home in New Brunswick. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. And this is Dan and the boys from the Community Brewer Shop. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you on the other side. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dan. Cheers. <laughs>